Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining Wonderful Wednesday. And today our topic really is inner aortic balloon counterpulsation. And I've labeled that timing is everything, but it's really about the intraortic balloon pump and a case. We have a lot to uncover and a lot to unpack. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right. So why is it that we consider using mechanical circulatory support or intraortic balloon pump, LVAD, Impella in patients? The reason we do it is when they have refractory left ventricular failure. That's what's really important to remember. Refractory left ventricular failure. If they're in cardiogenic shock or they have refractory ventricular dysrhythmias, after an acute myocardial infarction, that's very common to see uh, the utilization of mechanical circulatory support. If the patient has severe, profound mitral regurg, usually from a papillary muscle rupture or from an anteroseptal infarct, they have an opening in the septal wall between the right and the left heart. A lot of times when they're in the cardiac cath lab and they become unstable or they have refractory unstable angina in the cath lab, we'll place a balloon pump. And of course, the most common reason that we see it, I'm not even saying it's the best, just the most common re we see, reason we see it is when patients have been on pump for cardio, cardiothoracic surgery and they're having difficulty coming off pump. So we'll use a balloon pump basically to wean them from cardiopulmonary bypass, get them to the ICU, stabilize them, and hopefully return them to their prior function. But the main reason, so we can think about all those categories, and that's fantastic. It's really great to think about the categories. But the main reason is because the patient has failed medical therapy. So we talk about a pharmacologic balloon pump or pharmacologic circulatory support. That means inotrope plus either volume or diuretic, meaning you're giving volume or you're taking it away, plus vasodilator. Vasodilator plus inotrope plus volume, either give it or take it away and the patient does not respond, that's when they need mechanical circulatory support. Now, the easiest form of mechanical circulatory support that we can introduce here at Grady, the most common one worldwide, is the intra-aortic balloon counterpulsation device, okay? Now, in the shock trials and a side-by-side -side comparison of balloon pump to Impella, balloon pump to VAD, balloon pump is not the winner but it is the most common thing that people do when we have patients who have failure. So really important to talk about the ins and outs of the intraortic balloon pump. You basically have a cannula that is placed just below the subclavian, and that's the left subclavian artery, just below that. And that balloon inflates and deflates in timing to the dichrotic notch, and the end of diastole. So the balloon inflates at the dichrotic notch, which is the end of systole and the beginning of diastole, and the balloon deflates at the end of diastole. Inflates at the beginning of diastole, trapping blood, deflates at the end of diastole, uh, actually creating an open space in the aorta that the left ventricle can empty into. So we talk about the ins and outs of balloon pump. We're going to take a couple of looks at a couple of different things here. But what we want to remember is the primary purpose. Sometimes people say, oh, the purpose is to increase the blood pressure. No, that's not correct. The primary purpose is to trap blood in the aortic arch. That will increase blood flow cerebrally and it will increase blood flow into the coronary arteries. So what actually happens is we have a better coronary arterial blood supply, better coronary oxygen delivery all throughout diastole, which is when the coronary arteries are primarily perfused. And the second reason is to create this open space in the aorta. That's called the Winn-Kessel effect. We're going to take a look at that. Creating an open space in the aorta, which means that the left ventricle works less hard to empty itself of volume because we have this big wide open space in the aorta. As the balloon deflates, we've had distension in the aorta and the LV is ejecting quite easily. So that decreases the oxygen demand during systole. So we increase the delivery of oxygen during diastole and we decrease the coronary oxygen demand during systole. That's the real benefit 
of intra-earth balloon counterpulsation. So now we're just going to take a quick look at this again. And what I want you to know here are the arrows. Okay, so at, when the aortic valve closes, that creates the dichrotic notch. Your balloon will inflate. It's time to inflate at the dichrotic notch. Not the dichrotic notch in your radial artery, the dichrotic notch in the aorta. So the radial artery, there's a lot of delay there. You've got to flow that blood all the way out. It is pressure that is measured in the aorta and it's measured from the distal tip of the balloon catheter. Measuring AO pressure at the dichrotic notch of the AO, your balloon will inflate, okay? Now, because your balloon inflates, it's gonna push some blood when you inflate, um, I'm sorry, you're deflated here. When you inflate, sorry, you're going to push your blood up into the cerebral arteries. You're going to push blood into the coronary arteries. And as you're looking at this picture, this is your patient's left main, and this is your patient's right coronary. So as the balloon inflates, blood is pushed up into the cerebral arteries, pushed out into the coronary arteries, and pushed more distally, most particularly into the renal arteries when the balloon inflates. You increase that aortic diastolic blood pressure. You increase the diastolic coronary perfusion, cerebral perfusion, and hopefully peripheral distribution of blood all through that single act of inflating on time at the dichrotic notch. Balloon deflates just before the next systole, which is the end of diastole, and that opens up the aorta and creates a space, which means that the impedance to LV ejection goes down and you have a better blood flow delivery out into the aorta. Now, both of these events, inflation and deflation, are going to affect oxygenation. Remember, Inflation, if timed right, is going to increase coronary perfusion and therefore oxygen delivery. Deflation, if timed right, is going to create that open space in the aorta for the LV to eject into. So it's very simple and it's very straightforward. We have a nice flexible catheter that is placed through a sheath up into the descending aorta and the tip of the catheter is just below the left subclay uh, the left uh, subclavian artery okay that's the correct positioning and that is one of the most important things now you're not positioning that catheter your provider is going to do that your interventionalist your intensivist attending, maybe even your APPs, although generally it's not APPs, usually IC, interventional cardiology, or CT surgeons. But correct position is very important, and we're going to always look at position. We're going to evaluate position on a chest x-ray. We're going to assume position based on urine output and distal pulses. So for us as bedside nurses, Collecting that urine every day, monitoring those distal pulses is going to be really, really important when we're trying to assure that the position of our catheter is correct. Now, when that balloon inflates, it blocks about 90% of the aorta, and that's what displaces the blood distally and proximally to the coronary arteries, cerebral arteries, and distally out to the periphery. This is known as counterpulsation. So it's completely opposite of what's happening. The heart is ejecting the balloon deflated, okay? That sudden inflation, remember, moves the blood uh, distally and proximally, or we could call it superior and inferior. And when that balloon suddenly deflates within the aorta, creating that space, decreases its cardiac work. Very important to understand, it is always time to aortic pressure. And we have two ways of measuring aortic pressure when we have an intra-aortic balloon catheter in our patient. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Okay, now if timed right, inflating, inflating at the beginning of diastole at the dichrotic notch in the AO, deflating at the end of diastole just before the next systolic upstroke, what we're going to see is a reduction in the systolic pressure in the aorta and an increase in the diastolic pressure in the aorta. So that means that the left ventricle is going to eject against less resistance and we're gonna have better coronary blood flow.
As that occurs, the left ventricle is going to start to relax more. The tension of the ventricle is going to go down. The work of the ventricle is going to go down. The ventricle is going to empty more effectively, which is incredible. It's a wonderful thing. And the systolic pressure that's being generated is going to go down. The resistance to your LV ejection goes down. The volume gets moved more effectively, and that means that your cardiac output goes up. So you actually ensure a better blood flow dynamic, and you also ensure a better coronary blood flow. There are some contraindications. Let's just be sure we understand they're really, really simple. If your aortic valve or your aorta itself are not competent, so you're regurgitating in your aortic valve. If I inflate a balloon, you're going to regurgitate a lot. So I'm not going to do that if you have aortic regurgitation. I'm not going to inflate a balloon in the aorta if the aorta is dissecting. Oh, that's pretty straightforward. Now, we also, although here at Grady, you might see something different, but if you're going to take your CCRN or your CMC or your CSC exam, it, philosophically, we typically are not going to give a patient an intraortic balloon pump if they're, if they're in class four heart failure, end stage heart disease, because they are not going to be able to be weaned and they're not going to be able to recover. Here at Grady, pretty much, if you're critical, we're going to throw all sorts of things at you to try to resuscitate you. But worldwide, chronic heart failure does not meet criteria for a balloon. Typically, chronic end-stage heart failure may require transplantation, and in order to bridge to a transplant, that patient will typically get a VAD. Those are patients that have to be compliant with therapy. They have to have a home system that's actually going to support transplant, a cardiac transplant. So many of our patients don't meet criteria for cardiac transplantation because we work with uh, individuals from culture of poverty, and and a, a lot of our individuals are from a culture of poverty or a culture of homelessness, and we have to be sure that anyone who's going to get a bridge to transplant or that gets on a transplant list is going to be able to endure how difficult that is. Got to have a home, got to have a support system, got to take meds on time, can't be doing drugs, can't smoke, can't drink, all the wonderful things of life, I guess. So. It's really quite important. So these are the contraindications. Now there's other things that are relative contraindications. If, you're, if your peripheral vessels are very, very diseased, if you have aortic uh, reconstruction surgery, if you have an abdominal aneurysm, not, not an ascending or descending aneurysm, but an abdominal aneurysm, probably not gonna uh, actually get a balloon pump. We're gonna be really concerned about that patient. Now, it's really important to understand and appreciate what we call trigger and timing. With our balloon console, we actually have separate EKG leads, different than the ones from your monitor. They're attached to the console. Those EKG leads, a five-lead cable, five leads are placed on the patient. And the EKG is what notifies the uh, console, which directs inflation and deflation of the balloon. The EKG leads are what, you note, what notify the console that it's time to get ready to shuttle helium. Helium is what fills our balloon, and we use helium because it moves at the speed of light. It's really, really lightweight, and it's also an absorbable gas. Uh, obviously, we don't want our balloon to rupture, but if it did, it is an absorbable gas. So triggering traditionally comes from the EKG. Timing actually is based on the arterial blood pressure. Now, remember, we're not talking about your radial blood pressure. We're not talking about what's on your bedside monitor slave to the console. We're talking about aortic pressure. And that aortic pressure can be relayed to your console in two ways. There's never a reason that you can't do it if you've set up your console effectively. This is called timing. Timing means that the dichrotic notch in the aorta, which is going to happen much sooner than the dichrotic notch in the radial artery, that's when your balloon will inflate. And at the end of diastole, right before the next systolic upstroke, your balloon will deflate. That will maximize what intraoric balloon counterpulsation is doing. And that's really one of the most important things in terms of understanding balloons and intraoric balloon pump. Okay, so here's my art, aortic pressure, not my arterial pressure. Here's my dichrotic notch. And now I'm gonna add in a balloon inflation. 
inflating at the dichrotic notch, shuttling blood up, right, into the cerebral and coronary arteries, shuttling blood down into the periphery, and that is called diastolic augmentation. Now, diastolic augmentation is what you are all about when you're counterpulsating your patient. You want to optimize augmentation, and augmentation on your bedside monitor will be read by your bedside monitor as systole. That's why you never read from the bedside monitor. You don't read from the cath lab monitor. You don't read from the bedside monitor. You read from your console. This will be the highest pressure. It should always be the highest pressure. Balloon inflates on dichrotic notch. You get that high pressure as we're pushing blood into the coronary arteries and cerebral arteries, and as we're pushing blood distally. And then the balloon deflates right before the next systole. This is what we call timing, and timing is incredibly and critically important. So now I'm going to look at a patient who actually has an intraortic balloon counterpulsation device, and it's in a one-to-one -one timing episode. Now, I know that when I look at the patient because I understand the waveform, but also because I only see four pressures on my console. Four pressures. When I'm looking at the bedside monitor, I only have three pressures. Stop looking at the bedside monitor. Don't look at the bedside monitor. Look at the console. This is your patient's own systole, your patient's own diastole, their mean arterial pressure, and their augmentation. And your number one focus is on augmentation. Augmentation should always be higher than the patient's own systole. That tells us that our timing is right. Now I go to my bedside monitor and the bedside monitor says systolic pressure is 118. That's because it's reading augmentation. And also it's looking at an average pressure over six seconds. On your console, you're looking at the pressure every time it's generated. So these are never gonna actually match, but your systolic pressure on your bedside monitor should basically reflect your diastolic augmentation on your console. Then here's your diastolic pressure here. It's a little bit higher here because this is measured in the AO and I increase your diastolic pressure. And then your MAP is 74, but over here, your MAP is 80. Okay, really, really important. You're not gonna make these two match. It just, you can't do it. Stop looking at this. Always look at this. Console pressure is what you should be looking at, what you should be thinking about, and what you're going to treat. So if you're trying to make these numbers match from your bedside monitor, your cardiac cath lab monitor to your console, you're gonna go insane and your patient's gonna die because you're not monitoring the right thing. So we've gotta be sure that we appreciate and understand that when we talk about counterpulsation, how we're gonna use that device. Now, this is the operational screen of your balloon counterpulsation device. Really depends on who, you know, what manufacturer you're using, but there are going to be a couple of very significant similarities. Okay. So, first of all, we generally leave this in automatic mode. That means that the console is making the decision about inflation and deflation. If I want to change that, I have to go to semi automatic. If I want to change that, and I want to change the timing. OK, I'm not advising that to you. I don't think that you should be doing that. I don't think most of your doctors should be doing it or your APPs. Very few people are really that experienced with timing that they should change it. They're going to rely on the timing that's set by your device. So remember, you always want it to be in auto. Secondly, you're going to talk about trigger. Trigger is going to be EKG. Unless you have a patient with a pacemaker, in which case you may have to put them on pacer, pacer V, uh, ventricular pacer, or atrial ventricular pacer, so that would be your uh, AV sequential, or just an atrial pacer. Internal is what is used in the OR. You'll never, ever use that as your trigger. And if you have an EKG that is just profoundly abnormal, lots and lots of dysrhythmias, you may actually trigger end time based on pressure. But for basic balloon counterpulsation utilization, you're going to leave it on auto and you're going to use EKG as a trigger. Okay. So timing will always be set to pressure unless you do something different. We're not going to worry about anything else here because you're not going to set those. Then you also think about frequency. 
when an intraaortic balloon catheter is inserted, you will always be on one to one frequency. The only time you're ever going to go to one to two frequency, which means for every other beat of the heart, your balloon will inflate. The only time you're going to do that is if you're measuring timing or you're weaning. Otherwise, you're not going to use any other operation. Your patients should always stay in one to one. You're going to test them in one to two. You might even test them, although that's not advocated in one to three, because that's what your doctor said. But you will not actually place a catheter and put a patient in one to three. You're not assisting them. You would always put them at one to one and only transition to one to two when you wanted to check your timing. Okay. Now, augmentation means uh, how inflated the balloon becomes in order to trap more blood in the ascending aorta and more blood distributed peripherally. We're not going to change that. Okay. And then at the end, you have this timing regulator that for the most time, you're actually only going to be able to uh, make your deflation earlier or later. Typically, you're not going to do much with inflation. And we're not going to teach that here. That's not our purpose here. But we do want to look at this down here. This is your augmentation alarm, which should always be set at 10 below where you want your augmentation. So I want to, my patient's systolic pressure is 90. I want an augmentation. I would like it at around 15 to 20. So I'm looking for an augmentation that is 20 above 90. So that would be um, 110. And I'm going to set my augmentation alarm at 10 below. So I'm going to try for an augmentation at 20. And I'm going to set my augmentation alarm for 10 below. By the way, augmentation is the most important thing. That's why you're going to set a specific alarm for that. You're not really going to worry much about systole. You're not going to worry much about diastole. You're going to worry about augmentation. And the alarm on your console will be set for augmentation. Now, I want to just pull you up here to this little key that says calibrate pressure. And below that, you see it says hold for two seconds. Okay, this is on any device that you use, any manufacturer, so maybe you're using Arrow or you're using McKay, which is our the cardio help. It used to be, used to be, I think, used to be Datascope. Um, so those are the two main ones, Arrow and uh, McKay in today's world. You're always going to want to know where that calibrate pressure is because you can always calibrate the pressure. That's the balloon pressure. It's basically uh, returning as best as possible to zero and calibrating. And you're going to hold that key for two seconds if you need to calibrate pressure. Okay. So we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Okay. So how and why this works, right? Inflation works because when you inflate at the beginning of diastole, which is when the aortic valve closes, and it's based on the closure of the aortic valve and the pressure change that we see in the aorta, that's going to increase aortic volume and pressure. And why deflation works is because we reduce that aortic resistance when the balloon deflates. And that makes that nice potential open space in the aorta. That's what we call the Winkessel effect. Okay, so I want to make sure you understand, even though the word says pump, we don't really say that anymore. Most people just do, do still say intraaortic balloon pump. It's not a pump. It never was. It doesn't pump blood. It's not a vat. It's not an impella. It doesn't pump blood. So really, the better term and what you might see on your exam, because if they're using the term appropriately, it's going to be intraaortic balloon counterpulsation, I-A-B-C, intraaortic balloon counterpulsation. It's not a pump. A vat is a pump. An impella is a pump. Balloon pump is, not, balloon counterpulsation, sorry, is not a pump, okay? And unlike a vat or an impella, you got to have a beating heart. So the heart actually has to be electrically activated. It has to have a contraction. You can use a VAD or an impella in a non or, or very hypokinetic heart, non-kinetic or hypokinetic heart, still take blood out of the LV and eject it forward. You can do that with a VAD or an impella. You can't do it with a balloon pump. Have to have functional electrical, have to have some functional mechanical, some functional contraction. And if your contraction is really poor, I'm going to help that with an inotrope. 
then that's going to actually help me with the balloon pump. Okay. Now, just remember, it's going to create a change in the vascular resistance. That's going to be measured as the diastolic pressure. And it's going to open up the aorta, creating what we call a big wind kessel effect, which means better blood flow with less work from the left ventricle. So here is the wind kessel effect. We've dilated the aorta by inflating the balloon. And when we deflate the balloon, we have about 0.04 seconds for that LV to empty into that really big, large space. So I think this is quite helpful. We'll see. We're going to take a quick look at this video. Uh, I feel like it's rather helpful. It's a medical model that just shows you wind kessel. So here's your LV emptying through the aortic valve. It's, I mean, it's just a drawing, so just remember that. But now you're going to start to see this wind kessel effect, which actually helps to push that, pull that blood out. So it's almost like a suction device pulling the blood out of the left ventricle. And that is all related to your timing. So timing as the Pope says, and as you'll see at the end of my talk, timing is everything. Now, I think you may may not have seen that, but you can you can click onto this yourself because I had to unshare and reshare my screen and I didn't do that. Sorry about that. Okay, so now I want to remind you, in one-to-one, -one, meaning for every beat of the heart, the balloon is inflating and deflating for every single beat. That's called one-to-one. -one. You're going to read four pressures from your console. The most important one is the augmentation pressure, then systole, diastole, and mean. Augmentation, systole, diastole, and mean. And you're reading that from your console, not from your bedside monitor. Your bedside monitor is not projecting what you need to know about your console. Now, this is a McKay. And the reason I'm showing you this, which is very, very important, actually, with our McKay device, and it's going to be the same. You just have to know your own device. McKay is the most common device. When I have hooked up my patients, so my doctor has inserted this very beautiful flexible catheter up into the aorta through a sheath. Here's your sheath. And outside you have the trifecta, okay? The trifecta, okay, let me just wind that up, is this orange cable. And you'll see that the orange cable connects to this little door that you must open. You'll see the orange cable next to it on the visual. That is my fiber optic connection. The fiber optic connection by fiber optic transmission will transmit the arterial pressure by the fiber optic cable directly to the console from the aorta, okay? So I'm gonna open that door and stick my cable in there. That's my fiber optic cable. Okay. Now you can look at this catheter and you can see this flexible catheter is pretty fragile. So if your doc has placed this catheter and comes in and out a little bit, and they're like worried about where they are in the aorta and they pull back and then they push it forward again, it is possible that you can rupture the fiber optic cable, which means you no longer can use the fiber optic. Okay. So when I plug that orange in, that orange cable, and I plug that behind the door of the fiber optic connection, okay? I plug this, this gray area with the orange cable, I plug into that door where the orange cable and the connector visual is. If I've broken my fiber optic or I can't read the fiber optic, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press the calibrate pressure for two seconds. So I don't know that the fiber optic is broken. I just need to recalibrate. So when I don't have information on my console from my fiber optic connection, I'm not seeing my patient's blood pressure when the catheter is in position, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to press calibrate pressure for two seconds. Okay? If the fiber optic is broken and I can't recalibrate, I'm going to pull this out. I've got to pull it out because as long as that's plugged in there, you're telling the console you're reading fiber optic. But from that little trifecta, that's those three, you have this is your helium tubing, 
It has a connection on the end that actually goes in through this little hole right here, the little hole that's in the middle. So let me point to that with my cursor, that little hole. And you're gonna take this catheter, thread it through the hole and put the catheter tip in the internal hole. This is my helium connection, I'm done with that. But my responsibility, if you, you get a balloon pump in the OR, this, this other lumen, which doesn't have anything on it right now, when that patient comes out of the OR, when that patient comes out of the cath lab, they should always have a stopcock here. And that stopcock should be connected to pressure tubing to your standard transducer. So you have a standard transducer that you always use for monitoring pressure. The pigtail, which is what connects to your cable, is not going to be connected but you're gonna be connected from a stopcock to pressure tubing to a pressure bag under 300 millimeters of mercury to maintain a slow constant flush through the internal chamber of your catheter, which is another way that you can measure the aortic pressure. So now I'm gonna shift over to the other side, to your left-hand side, where you see that red connector, which is plugged in, and the visual shows you from patient to console. I can directly monitor your aortic pressure. I had to pull the fiber optic cable out, but I can directly monitor your aortic pressure via my transducer. But the little pigtail at the end of the transducer, that little pigtail is what connects to the pressure cable. And in order for that to connect to the back of your balloon console, you have to have a, a, a connector from the console and then an adapter, and that adapter comes from whoever makes your, cat, your transducers. For us here at Grady, for most people, that is Edwards. So I have to have two connections. First of all, this red one, and then I must have another connector from Edwards that actually will translate from that connector to the pressure transducer. Now, this is always done better in person when we have all the connectors, et cetera but I wanna make sure you understand that you need to have aortic pressure. You either do it fiber optically or you do it via pressure tubing that is connected to your balloon pump catheter and that is monitoring aortic pressure because by the way, timing is everything. Remember, you're always gonna read your pressure from your console and your pressure must be read from the aorta, not from the radial arterial or the femoral arterial or the brachial arterial line. It's gotta be read from the aorta. So when your fiber optic isn't working, the first thing you're gonna do, remember, is you're gonna recalibrate. Still not working, you're gonna detach your fiber optic and then you're gonna attach the connector cable, the adapter and connect that to your transducer, okay? Now, historically, our patients would come from CT surgery with a stopcock connected, turned off to the patient. And by the time anybody thought, oh, Barbara told us that we need to have a pressure bag to this, they've already clotted, which means if you have a fiber optic failure, you have no other way to measure aortic pressure, which means that you are not going to be able to operate your balloon at the best capacity. So by the way, one of the first things you do when you receive a patient with a balloon counterpulsation device, check that trifecta. Make sure you understand when I say trifecta that that one last hub should have a stopcock, should be connected to pressure tubing, should be connected to a transducer and to a bag at 300 millimeters of mercury because that's what maintains a constant low flow under very little pressure through that catheter. You will never draw blood from here. You will never manually flush this. It's in the aorta. If you have the smallest clot and you manually flush it, you're gonna put that clot up into the brain. So you can't manually flush. You don't pull the pigtail. It just needs to be constant, okay? Now, whenever we set up, remember I told you, you're always gonna be in one-to-one. -one. That's gonna be your frequency. But when you need to check timing, you're going to go to frequency and change that to one to two only for a short period of time while you check the timing. It always should be done in less than five minutes and then back to one to one. 
If you are weaning or you're testing patients for weanability, you can go to one to two, but it should never be for more than 15 minutes. And then you go back to one to one. If patients can tolerate one to two, you'll know that at the end of 15 minutes. If they tolerate one to two, it may be time to pull the catheter, okay? In general, we do not use a setting of one to three. And in some other older devices, you may actually have a setting of one to four. On the newer consoles, you can't go beyond one to three and that is not even recommended. Okay, so remember that calibrate pressure and remember one to three is not the best thing for us to do. Okay, so remember what we talked about with the goals of inflation. We're gonna increase coronary perfusion, cerebral perfusion, gonna increase aortic root pressure and we're gonna improve the Winkessel effect. Okay, but how I'm going to know that, because I can talk about Winkessel and all these other things, how I know that when I come to your bedside, how you know that when you come to your bedside, is your patient's heart rate has come down, their wedge pressure has come down, their CVP has come down. If wedge pressure or PAD go up, CVP go up, something's wrong with your timing. If the heart rate goes up, something is wrong with your timing. So you're looking for the heart rate to come down, the wedge pressure to come down, the PAD to come down, the CVP to come down. That's related to inflation. When we talk about deflation, remember deflation is decreasing the resistance to ventricular rejection. So what I'm going to expect to see primarily is a reduction in wall tension. Because I have a reduction in wall tension, my wedge and my PAD should come down. So yay, I only had to look at that once and I could use it for both. But the other thing that's really important is that empty space in the aorta through that Winkessel effect, which means I distended the aorta, the balloon deflates, and I have a very short 0.04 seconds time when the aorta is distended that the LB can eject into the aorta. Fantastic, fantastic. That means that your patient's systolic pressure after augmentation, make sure you're paying attention now, the patient's systolic pressure should drop. Drop, because the LV doesn't have to work very hard. So the systolic pressure drops. After augmentation, systolic pressure should drop. After augmentation, the patient's diastolic pressure should drop. Both of them will drop. Now, aortic root pressure is going to go up, but you're not at the root. You're in the just at just before the loop of the aorta in the ascending aortic, um, right before the aortic arch. Okay, most important though, most important is the augmented diastolic pressure. That's gonna be the highest number that you see. That should always be higher than the patient's systolic pressure. Always, always, always. Augmented diastolic pressure should be the highest number you see. And your bedside monitor can't make a difference between that. It's just gonna call that systole. That's why you're ignoring the bedside monitor and you're looking at the pressures on your console. The amount of augmentation that occurs depends on your patient's volume status, what, what underlying LV function they have, and also by your timing. So when augmentation is poor, I'm gonna consider when augmentation is poor, typically for me, if it's less than 10, that's really poor. I want you to be closer to the 20, but if it's less than 10 or it's close to the patient's, systolic, patient's own systolic pressure, which you got from the console, that's poor augmentation. I'm going to consider, do you need volume? Is my timing right? Or do you need a vasopressor? Timing right, volume, vasopressor. Okay. That augmented diastolic pressure is what is going to so profoundly impact your mean pressure. It's going to really regulate because now our mean pressure, because it's part of diastole, the mean pressure is going to go up. As the mean pressure goes up, I have better blood flow dynamic. Now, we want to remind ourselves that uh, basically perfusion is not just about pressure. It's also about time. And remember, I told you if your timing is right, your heart rate has come down. So you have more time for perfusion. You have a better mean arterial pressure. You have better blood flow and oxygen delivery. That's what you understand. You may not be able to measure it, but you're going to understand it because you must have an augmented pressure that is 10 to 20 above your patient's systolic pressure. 
Okay, so lots of things affect augmentation. Most of these over here, physical, are about the balloon catheter, the position of the catheter, the volume in the balloon, the diameter of the aorta, how much of the aorta is occluded. Is it is it 98% or is it 85 to 90%, which is what we want? Or is the catheter too small and it's not occluding enough of the aorta? That's all going to affect augmentation. Those are things that require a much higher level than the majority of people at the bedside have, and that's okay. We're going to think about this. Do you have enough ventricular ejection to determine an aortic pressure? And do you have enough ventricular volume to maintain the volume relationship in the aorta? So the first thing I'm going to think about, if I don't have good augmentation, I'm going to look at timing first. Then I'm going to consider the patient may need volume. I'm going to consider the patient may need an inotrope. I'm going to consider that the patient may need a vasopressor. And then I'm ultimately going to say, is something wrong with my catheter? And basically what I'm going to do is get an x-ray. Okay. All right. So console reads four pressures in one-to-one. -one. In one-to-one, -one, the four pressures read by the console. Can't get four pressures on your bedside monitor. Stop looking at the bedside monitor. It's crazy. You have a counterpulsation device. Number one, diastolic augmentation. Number two, systole. Number three, diastole. And number four, MAP. These are not going to match what's on your console. So don't try to make it match. When you're checking your timing, the console is going to read six pressures. Those six pressures are unassisted diastole, unassisted systole, augmentation, and following augmentation will be assisted diastole and assisted systole. So Unassisted diastole, unassisted systole, augmentation, assisted diastole, assisted systole. And all titration and volume resuscitation should be, be based on the mean arterial pressure that you're reading on your console. It will not match what's up on your bedside monitor. Treat the pressure you're seeing on the console. That's aortic, it's real pressure, it's real time right now, and that's what you're going to treat. All right, so we're going to just take a quick look at this. Okay, so in one-to-one -one balloon pump frequency, every bead is getting augmented, so you have no idea what the timing is. Now, you know the patient before you started with your balloon counterpulsation, your patient's heart rate was 150, their systolic pressure was 120, their diastolic pressure was 70, their MAP was 90. You start a counterpulsation and their heart rate dropped, their own systolic pressure, which is, uh, which is I'm so sorry, which is this, their own systolic pressure, which is this, it's assisted, but it's their own pressure. That dropped, their diastolic pressure dropped, but their augmentation is high. So you're pretty happy. Augmentation looks good. Systole is down, diastole is down. But how you really know is their CVP is down, their wedge pressure is down, their PAD is down, and their heart rate's down. Those are the four things you're going to really look at. Wedge, PAD, CVP, and heart rate all should go down if your timing is right and you are operating effectively with your counterpulsation device, okay? But the only way to actually check your timing is to go to one to two. So what you're gonna look at here, here's your, you're gonna look at, I always talk about the group of, uh, the group of three, high peak, high peak, high peak. Look at the three peaks. I know I'm on one to two, the one in the middle is augmentation. Before augmentation, I have unassisted diastole and unassisted systole. This is augmentation that occurs on diastole. So after augmentation, I have assisted diastole and assisted systole. Find your augmentation first. Before that, in a one to two, will be unassisted systole. And before that, will be unassisted diastole. After augmentation, assisted diastole and assisted systole. Now, if you're going to take your CCRN, you're going to take a CMC, you're going to take a CSC, you've got to know that. You're going to have to know it. You'll have a strip that shows augmentation, beat before, unassisted systole, before that, unassisted diastole. Augmentation, following that, assisted diastole, which should always be lower. 
Assisted systole, which should always be lower. So prior to augmentation, systole and diastole are going to be higher. After augmentation, systole and di diastole and systole are going to be lower. And that's really the key. In one-to-one, -one, I, I can't assess timing. I must go to one-to-two to assess timing. I can think things are right. I've, tr I've trusted my device. I'm on automatic, but I still have a responsibility to assess timing. Okay, here is a one-to-one. -one. So here are the four pressures that I get from my bedside monitor. Augmentation 116, systole 102, diastole 52, and mean 84. Going to be significantly different from what I see on my bedside monitor. I'm not going to use my bedside monitor. I'm going to use my console pressures. Okay. So this is one to one. Okay. Now it, it tells you it's one to one as well. You can see that right here, that it's one to one, but you also can see that it's one to one. Okay. When I want to check timing, I have to go to one to two. Now in one to two, remember, I look at the group of three, three peaks, center peak is augmentation. Before augmentation is unassisted systole, and before that is unassisted diastole. Unassisted diastole has always got to be higher than assisted diastole. It should be five, five to eight millimeters higher. We'll just say five to 10. Unassisted systole is always higher than assisted systole. That's going to be about five to eight higher in unassisted than assisted. That tells me my timing is good. Assisted systole, lower than unassisted. Assisted diastole, lower than unassisted. I have a good mean and I have the highest augmentation. So the way I'm going to document that, the way you're going to be asked about it, you might be given those numbers on a test, is here's your augmented pressure. That was the patient we looked at, 112. And when he was in a one to two re relationship, his unassisted systole was 76, but he dropped five to his assisted systole. So assisted is less than unassisted as it should always be. Assisted should be less than unassisted. That's the way it should be. And it's five below. So yay, we think that's pretty great. Unassisted diastole is 54, but assisted diastole is 40, uh, 49. So that's a drop of five. I might be able to maximize that, but I'm okay. I'm pretty happy. So I'm documenting augmentation, unassisted systole, assisted systole, unassisted diastole, assisted diastole, and mean pressure. And I got that directly from my console in a one to two ratio, which you see right there. I'm going to have assisted is going to be the top number and it's going to be bigger. Unassisted is below that. Assisted, the top number and it's bigger and unassisted below that. So now I have one, two, three, four, five, which is my map and six, which is my augmentation. If you're looking at that, do you think I'm pretty happy? You would be right if you said yes, I'm pretty happy. We've been able to achieve what we started out with. And if we get all wound up in other things, we're looking at the bedside monitor, we're flipping out, we're calling everybody, your patient looks pretty good. Now, you might want him to have a little bit of volume. You might give him some volume. That's what he looks like to me. He probably needs a little bit of volume and I might give that to him. Okay, so remember, look for that group of three, peak one, peak two, peak three. The one in the middle is augmentation. Before that is unassisted systole, and before that is unassisted diastole. After that is assisted diastole and assisted systole. Always follows augmentation. Got to be in a one to two if you really want to look at what's happening. So here we are in a one to two ratio. Okay, we've already looked at this patient. We just looked at him before. Okay. Here's another patient. We've also seen this patient before. He is in one to two, and you can find augmentation and then the other two peaks. The peak before is unassisted systole, and before unassisted systole is unassisted diastole. So unassisted diastole, unassisted systole, augmentation, following augmentation, assisted diastole, and assisted systole. And you look over here at your six pressures. Unassisted was 107, assisted 102, a drop of five, good. Unassisted diastole 70, assisted 65, a drop of five. Good. MAP is 89, 
augmentation 114, and that's 12 higher than my patient's systole. I'm feeling pretty good. I feel like things are going pretty well for my patient. Okay, that's what we look at with one to two timing. Three peaks, center peak is augmentation, pre-augmentation, post-augmentation. Pre-augmentation, don't look at this. That's not something you're looking at. You're looking at the systole and the diastole before augmentation. You're looking at the diastole and the systole after augmentation. Those are what you're gonna do. Now, I wanna remind you, bedside monitors look at three pressures. They typically call the peak augmented diastolic pressure, which is diastolic pressure, not systolic pressure, but your bedside monitor is gonna call it systole. It reads diastole and it reads MAP. Non-invasive blood pressure monitors three pressures. So again, non-invasive looks at systole, diastole, and MAP. Remember, your console actually is gonna look at four to six pressures. In a one-to-one, -one, systole, diastole, MAP, augmentation, okay? Systole, diastole, MAP, and augmentation. In a one-to-two, systole, diastole, MAP, augmentation, unassisted systole, unassisted diastole. That's how you are measuring your timing. And finally, the balloon pressure waveform. So I'm just gonna finish up with that. The balloon pressure waveform is the waveform that you saw at the bottom of the screen. That is telling you how helium is shuttling, how much volume is being displaced, okay? So all I want you to appreciate is that the balloon pressure height is representing the pressure in the aorta and the balloon pressure width is gonna represent the time that the balloon is inflated. And what's typically gonna happen is that you want it to appear like a ladder back chair. This is time, this is pressure. Time, pressure. So I'm gonna look at this balloon pressure waveform and I want you to appreciate that this should always look like a ladder back chair, okay? Now my patient's heart rate is 100, that's not super fast, but it's a little bit tachycardic. And you see, I really don't have much of a ladder back, okay? So what I'm gonna say here, because my patient's own pressure is 71 and, and that, I mean, 76, and their assisted systole is 71, I'm gonna give them just a bit of volume. And I'm gonna actually expect that I'm gonna get a better chair-like appearance in my balloon pressure waveform. Okay. You're always going to have variations in the balloon waveform. The faster your heart beats, the more you're going to lose the ladder back. The slower the heart beats, the more seat you're going to have, right? That's the seat that's called the plateau. So faster, shorter, because you have shorter time, and slower heartbeat, the longer you have for that plateau, okay? When your patient's hypertensive, your plateau is going to go up. You still have a plateau but now it's elevated. And if you're hypotensive, that plateau is gonna drop. Okay, so let's look back at this patient, okay? What you're seeing here is they don't have very much time for a plateau, right? But their heart rate's only 100. So what that means to me is that I'm gonna give them volume. You can just give some volume, just give 500 cc, see if that improves their plateau. Okay, lots of things that nurses need to do really, really, really important is that you're gonna keep the leg that's been cannulated super stiff and in a device to protect the patient from moving or kinking their catheter. You've got to have them in a device that keeps the leg straight and they don't kink the catheter. It is possible, very, very important, you're always gonna take the left uh, upper extremity pulse because that pulse is the pulse that's gonna be affected if your balloon is in the wrong place. You're gonna see a disappearance of that pulse. You may also see loss of the distal pulse in the lower extremity on the side where the catheter has been placed. You need to pay a lot of attention to that. Lots of times patients come back from the OR, they don't really have a good pulse. We Doppler and there's a Doppler in your, in your drawer to see if they have blood flow. So you're always gonna check for distal blood flow. If the pulse in the left upper extremity disappears, this is an emergency. 
Okay. If the pulse diminishes in the lower extremity, you're concerned, you need to report it. It's not as much of an emergency unless you have discoloration of the limb, in which case it's an emergency. Okay. So balloon misplacement or migration, you're going to lose your left, left upper extremity pulse. And that's typically if it's migrating upwards. If it's migrating downwards, you're going to occlude the renal artery, which means the urine output is going to go down. Your output every hour. I don't care what you've done before. Every two hours in an ICU patient is not adequate. You must look at urine output every hour, and especially with the balloon pump. Now, the balloon can rupture. So now we actually have gas going out into the aorta. You're going to get a console alarm, and your patient will become unstable immediately. Okay. If the balloon is leaking, what will also happen is you're going to get some blood or brown flecks that come back that you're going to see actually in your sheath. So in the sheath, you start to see some blood in the sheath. You're seeing brown flecks. That's an emergency. You need to actually stop the balloon. You need to stop shuttling helium because your patient's got a fracture. This is an emergency. Catheter is going to have to be removed. But you're going to stop counterpulsation if you see blood in the sheath. Now, I'm not talking about some blood that was there when the patient came back. There was just a little bit of blood. I'm talking about new blood or brown flecks, which is coagulated blood. If I see that in the sheath, I got to turn it off. So the things we've already talked about, these are all things that can happen when you have a balloon pump in position. But if your timing is right, your heart rate will decrease, your PAD will decrease, your wedge pressure will decrease, your cardiac output index stroke volume will increase, you'll improve your acidosis, you'll improve your SAO, uh, SVO2, your patient is going to improve because you've assisted the left ventricle appropriately. This is only a left ventricular assist device. It's not assisting the right ventricle. It's not in the pulmonary artery. It's in the aorta. It's an assistance to a failing left ventricle. So the end is in sight. And remember what the Pope says, timing is everything. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording. I'm going to thank you again for joining.